Unlike Steve Delachinsky, I'm not an angry young man. What's there to be angry about in a world with music like this and people like this? Republicans. <laughs> Most Democrats, but that's besides the point. And uh, like many of you, I saw Peter many times before I met him. He was the legendary audience member who looked like Mr. Natural. In that picture without the hat, he really looks like Mr. Natural. And uh, then I got to know him. And uh, I think shortly after I first met him, I ran into him on the subway. I said hello. First words out of his mouth were, Oh, Moondock's playing tomorrow night. You gotta go. So uh, I knew I wanted to read something to honor Peter, and I knew it had to be about music, so this sort of is about music. The Ravages of Time. I met Brian about 15 years ago as a result of overlapping musical interests. At some point in our friendship, maybe around 2005, Brian told me about his favorite LP, which he had bought in 1972 at age 18, when he was just becoming interested in alternative musical forms. The album was called The Ravages of Time, and it was blank on both sides. Well, not completely blank, there were grooves, of course, but the grooves contained nothing but silence. Both sides had a plain white label in the middle with nothing printed on it. The album, Brian told me, was issued in a limited edition of only 100 copies. Brian felt extremely fortunate to have snagged it. The concept of the album was that with repeated listenings, the music would change that every playing of the recording would be different as the LP accrued skips, pops, and crackles through wear, dust, and the other ravages of time. The only way to tell one side from the other, besides the oral evidence, was by the subtle aging differences of the plain white center labels. Over the years, the music became much more complex, but for the listeners, there were always memories of past states that contributed to the experience of the work, a palimpsest of oral memory. The album became a legend in certain circles, and recently a record producer, who is committed to aleatory forms, decided to put the album out on CD. But, as every copy was different, very different indeed after 40 years of different patterns of play, the question was which source to use. The producer eventually made the bold decision to put out a box set. <laughs> he tracked down 50 copies of the album that were still in the hands of the original owners and transferred them to CD. Through a generous grant from a foundation that supported such projects, he was able to release the set earlier this year. In order to keep within the spirit of the original, each CD was unlabeled and the set contained no liner notes and no information about the owners of the original source LPs. The 50 CD set received mixed reviews. <laughs> While some praised the attempt to document the music before all old copies disappeared or became too difficult to find, most complained that freezing the music in digital form was antithetical to the intent of the work, that it was no longer vital, ever-changing, forward-thinking music. It was now nothing more than a museum piece. But for me, it's something different, and wonderful in its own way. It may lo no longer be music that changes and surprises every time it's played. In fact, divorced from its original context, it may no longer make sense to call it music at all. But for me, it is now biography, a document of 40 years in the lives of those 50 listeners. Interestingly oblique, intriguingly indecipherable biographies of 50 anonymous lovers of a certain type of art. Thank you.